Dan is around startup and corporate collaboration. And I'm going to ask the four startups that we just presented um, to join us here. Um, and my first question is around exploration versus focus problems. And typically, and I would almost call this conventional uh, wisdom or conventional advice, typically we, we like to ask corporates to start with a business problem. What's the use case? What's the business problem? And, um, and then start addressing that. And then we can figure out, okay, which are the startups that might help you. But then at the same time, we know that serendipity plays a role in corporate innovation and exploration is really important. In fact, there have been a number of cases when I've seen a startup have a corporate meeting and then pivot into a new use case and then go on to be acquired. So that's an important component as well. How do you guys think about this? Um, and in fact, are, are you willing to take small deals up front to explore new use cases or do you feel like the relationship has to be strategic, has to be a top identified corporate priority before you move ahead? Michael, please go ahead, but you need to unmute first. Great. Thanks. No, I, I think it's an interesting question and I'd say from our perspective, the early stage exploration collaborations for us that have worked out well have always uh, been very thoughtful in terms of both involving high level decision makers within our partners organization. So we get some buy in that if this goes well, there's going to be some, some support from above to move this forward. One and two, I think some very clear success criteria. So what does the outcome of this study have to look like in order for our partner to believe that this is worth taking to the next step? I think the collaborations we've struggled with have been kind of small dollar amount collaborations with maybe an uh, external innovation group or an early stage R&D group that's doing some, I'll call it kind of tinkering, but they don't necessarily have buy-in from those above or a clear image or understanding of what they want to get out of it. Jack, do you have a comment you want to add? Sure. I think that uh, Michael's exactly right on. We've had uh, our best collaborations have been with companies that are prioritizing, Marcus, kind of to your point. And companies that uh, realize that there's real value here, uh, if they can, in, in our case, lower the cost of their products while improving some performance attributes. So they fast track it and they apply resources. Uh, where we've had challenges, I think, are areas where um, it's something they're just tinkering with and something that, you know, is a year or two away or three years away before they're really going to get serious about it. Got it. Maybe what? just to, to, yeah, to, probably. to add. To add to, to that, we, we've had uh, both types of, of collaborations and the earlier ones, we were trying to validate our platform, but they were on an unpaid manner. And mm. so these were really with R&D uh, folks on, on the, the counterpart. And we learned about our platform. We got some exciting results, but really the ones that are moving the needle are the ones that are committing a little bit of funds in order to do uh, that exploration because it aligns with whoever is a decision maker on their side. So uh, exploration is okay if there's a little bit of a commitment from uh, the partner. Right. Um, next question here. How do you think about exclusivity? Um, you know, so this is a point where you've maybe proven some value and, and um, you, you're at the negotiation stage. Um, what, you know, at what point is it reasonable to grant exclusivity in your mind? Never. I'll go. It's, it's, it's challenging. Um, you know, we, uh, we granted exclusivity for a certain geographic region uh, in the Baltics where our first large partner is, you know, completing a, a commercial scale plant with us right now. And they've licensed the technology and they'll be paying us royalties down the road. But so the Baltic states uh, are off limits for other partners that we join. Um, but that was for, frankly, many millions of dollars that they were willing to put into the equation. And so it, it comes down to that, um, that weighing of the value that they're bringing to you versus uh, what you're giving up. Um. Marcus, I'm, I'm happy to chime in there as well. Yeah, um, please. We, we deal in exclusivity pretty often. Um, you know, I think it's really reflective of, of our business model more than anything. Since we do have diversity in application, we can focus very 
specifically on commercializing with one major partner in a vertical. Um, and that gives us, you know, a lot of the ability to navigate long-term relationships because of that umbrella. Um, but it is a, we price in the opportunity cost um, when, when thinking about that. Right. And I'll, Quickly, from our perspective, Marcus, we actually look at exclusivity, I think, a little bit differently. So we have a, you know, a, a delivery platform that has, I think, a range of different applications. And we have our two internal programs that we're driving. That's really our focus. If a partner comes to us and says they want exclusivity in a field or they want to work with us in a certain field, we actually insist on them paying for that exclusivity up front to show that there is kind of a longer term commitment here. So, you know, we, we rarely do kind of early stage tinkering without a partner who's willing to come, put some money on the table, at least for an exclusive option to license in the long run. So mm-hmm. for us, it's kind of part of that showing uh, sincerity from the partner again, that they're, they're coming to the table and understanding what they're looking for and they at least have a vision of moving this beyond just early stage feasibility. Right. Is, is, by the way, is um, exclusivity a, a common request? Oh, yes. Is an issue you deal with? Yeah, I, I, I'll chime in here. I, I've seen it a couple of times now. I'm actually in conversations on this very same topic. And it really depends on the stage of the company. So earlier stage versus later stage. And what the partner, how advanced they are in the particular field. If they are a dominant player, you might want to associate with them because that can propel your company and set up for success in the long term. So it, it depends who's asking for the exclusivity as well. Yeah. And, and so move, moving forward here, um, let's talk a little bit about IP um, and when it makes sense to sort of co-develop and um, share in IP. And, and I, I know there are startups that I've talked to from, from this great community where co-developing and uh, sharing IP, just they would never think about it. They've sort of gone down that path, learned the hard way that it doesn't work, at least for them. Um, and I'm just curious if, if within this group, it's something that you, you think about and uh, what your thoughts are and it doesn't make sense and how, how does it make sense? Michael. So I'll, I'll go quickly on this one. So we, we've actually got a structure that we love that we stole from Moderna, which is to say our collaborations typically have very clear language saying, you know, that the rising IP is either jointly owned or owned by the inventing party with the caveat on the back end that no IP can be filed without express written permission from both parties. So essentially what it does is is allows us to get a deal over the hump early without really negotiating who gets rising IP. How do you split background versus foreground IP? allows us to get into the collaboration quickly. And then if valuable IP is generated over the course of that, obviously it forces you both back to the table to negotiate a follow-on license or follow-on agreement. So it's a really nice way for us to move quickly with a partner and kind of kick those discussions down the road rather than getting stuck on those and letting those bog down partnerships. Mm -hmm. Jack. Uh, ours is a little different because uh, Michael's, you know, he's actually developing a, pro- a final product um, that relies on ongoing focus with his company. In our case, uh, we're producing a final product that becomes an ingredient. So the IP for the brand new product, let's say the coat, coating, the paint, the packaging, really is 100% the large partners. We own the IP on just our stuff. And so we sign agreements along those lines, NDAs typically up front. Uh, And then the collaboration, we're helping the large company develop the final product that is theirs proprietary. Makes sense. Um, So we're going to wrap up very soon here. And I just want to remind the audience that if you haven't made your selections in the polls, in the poll, then uh, please go ahead and do so now, because once we we close, then you you can't answer this one. Um, As a final question here, I'd like uh, you to share perhaps what you view as your best partnership. You don't have to name names, but talk a little bit about the process of how that started, what went well, and and, um, what were the defining parameters of that relationship that made it a productive relationship? And anyone can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I I can jump in since we're we're actively in in one that is going really well. Uh, uh, key lessons learned from others. Uh, So the the first thing was that in order to entertain one of these engagements, we did bring some uh, data 
some data that the partner saw as compelling. And it wasn't necessarily in the cell type that, they're, that they are interested in, but it was close enough that they saw some hints. And when we went into the meeting, one of the key things for our success was the fact that there were individuals from discovery, from process development, and from the business side, uh, SVP level individuals that were decision makers. And so in one presentation, we were able to get buy-in from the entire organization in order to really craft a plan that made sense for them and for us. And, and really, I think one of the things that has been very useful, before we conducted any experiments, we had a kickoff meeting in which we all got together in a room, went through the logistics of how this relationship would go. There was clear success criteria, as Michael alluded to. And, mm -hmm. and we have constant check-ins, monthly meetings in which we share results. We can address any things that have come up that might require tweaking. And we are excited about the, the progress so far. So that, that has been a really successful engagement for us. All right, anyone else? Jack, please. I'll be very brief, Marcus. Um, so communication has been the key, um, really high level of communication, frequent communication, developing close relationships so that you really have champions inside these companies uh, to look out for you and uh, communicate everything that's going on. Um, we've had really good luck with folks who, uh, one partner in particular, they had a large existing business where we were able to help shore that up. But what they were most excited about was moving into new areas where they can compete more effectively using a brand new product set that they could develop with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Michael, I'll just, your turn. I'll just chime in with one final one, which is for us speed and our partner's ability to move at the same pace that we're moving has been the key differentiator for us. So we have one uh, Korean partner, Green Cross Pharma, who's been fantastic for us. I think they go by GC Pharma now, so I don't want to offend them, but they've been wonderful. Basically, if we send an email request during the day, kind of US time, they'll send us a request back basically during the day their time. So it's literally one day iteration on these question cycles. The collaboration is just flying much, much, much more quickly because of that. So that speed um, to us is something that's it's, it's really been a, a key differentiator. Great, thank you, Michael. Adam, do you want the last word here? Sure, I think, you know, double down on communication and all of this is about like relationship strength and relying on each other in that relationship. And so, you know, I think we all talk about technical milestones and otherwise, but making sure the people side is equally well addressed in both directions is probably the real unlock uh, for every successful relationship that we've been able to enter. Great, thanks so much. So this uh, concludes the Stex25 showcase. Um, it's been a real honor to be able to organize this for all the attendees across the world. I, I mentioned it on day one, we had um, over 750, I think now 850 people registered from um, across over 150 different companies from 36 different countries. So really amazing, uh, feel fortunate to be able to put this together for you. Again, uh, if you answered the poll for a request for introduction, we're going to be reaching out over the next week and facilitating those introductions. If you have any questions or we want to follow up with me, again, my email is marcusd at mit.edu. Thank you very much. <laughs>